Ordnance Survey map. I suppose maps are things that we take for granted these days, but have you ever thought what it takes to make one of these things? It's rather like the daily bottle of milk. It turns up on the doorstep, but what's involved in getting it there is another question. Map making is a highly sophisticated technical process. In fact, to be more precise, it's a whole series of processes. And one aspect of it which is vitally important is photography. The headquarters of the Ordnance Survey is here in Southampton, where 2,000 people are involved in the production of 12 million maps a year. Although the whole of Britain has been surveyed, there's a constant need to update the information contained in the maps. The roads being built, new housing schemes, boundary alterations, and the rerouting of footpaths are just some of the reasons why the face of Britain is constantly changing. The arrangements for making the new map start with the field surveyor, and his first job is to contact the air survey department. He requests us to fly uh, areas which have changed since the last map was made, and then we have the responsibility of flying them and uh, getting aerial photographs of them. On this map, we see the uh, targets which we're photographing this year. And as you can see, they extend from John O'Groats to Land's End. There are some 250 of them. And we expect to expose uh, 10,000 photographs, which represents about a mile and a half of film. Well, now, this is the camera. And this is Chief Surveyor Bert Moore, who I hope is going to explain it to me. First impression of it, seeing it close to it, it's massive. Why so big? Yes, well, it's, this is rather a sophisticated piece of equipment compared to a normal amateur camera. The picture format is nine inches by nine inches. And this is necessary to cover the ground with photography in the most economical manner. Because we have a large format, the focal length is 12 inches. Just explain that to me briefly. Focal length of the lens has got to equal, what is it, the diameter the across diameter there? Across the diameter across frame. the negative. Right. Can we now see how it actually works? What's the first thing that you do? The first thing is to place a film magazine on the camera. Right. Now, you want that up there, do yes. you? Yes. Were... Oh, of course, that's a weight. That must be fun in a light aircraft, isn't it? This weighs about 60 pounds. What's the weight of the whole thing? In total, the camera unit weighs approximately 400 pounds. Pretty heavy. Any chance of seeing the film that's in there? Yes, we have a dummy film in the magazine so I can lift the lid. Gosh. <laughs> that is a bit different from what I normally use. There's your, your 120 film for your box camera. And there's your 35 mil. All right, Bert, let's assume we've got a proper film in it and the lid's on, then what? Then we're ready to take photographs. And this piece of equipment is used for that purpose. It, it merely controls the actions of the camera. In essence, it consists of a box with a lens at the bottom, similar to an ordinary camera. We don't take a picture from this camera there. Instead, we place a ground glass screen in the focal plane and we can view the image of the ground on the screen. The Ordnance Survey don't recruit actual photographers. In fact, they're trained surveyors who have an aptitude for the job and enjoy flying. Although they learn to use the equipment fairly quickly, it takes about two years before a photographer gets to assess the best weather conditions and to be able to interpret what they're photographing. The weather's all important. They'll only fly when there's a cloudless target area. And waiting for that can mean many idle hours at airfields, constantly checking with the Met Office. Because of this, flying only takes place between the 1st of March and the end of September. During those months, there's a better chance of clear weather, and also the sun is high in the sky. A very important factor in aerial photography, because long shadows on the ground can confuse the interpretation of the photograph. 
Once they're over the target area, the aircraft is flown in a series of parallel lines at a height of 5,000 feet, and the equipment is checked out. The maximum aperture of the lens is 5.6, and the photographer normally operates at that. Exposure readings are taken with a conventional light meter, the only difference being that the cell of the meter is set into the aircraft fuselage, and the readout is situated by the camera. format of the camera is nine inches square and this large size combined with slow black and white film gives the best possible resolution. The shutter is specially designed to fit the large lens and the normal shutter speed is set between a three hundredth and a four hundredth of a second depending upon light conditions. The lens has a focal length of 12 inches and a yellow filter is fitted to eliminate haze which is always a problem with aerial photography when the subject is such a long way from the lens. Okay, running it. Coming up with camera on. Stand by camera. Camera on. The aircraft captain checks okay, the target on. area with his okay, co-pilot, and when he's sure they're okay, over the correct eight, area, eight. gives the go-ahead to the okay, photographer. From now on, the camera will automatically take a series of photographs at set okay, intervals of time. Steady. Touch right. Hold that. Steady, steady, steady. Okay, approaching the end of the line. Stand by to keep the camera. intervals constant, a chain ladder okay passing across the ground glass viewfinder is set to move at the same speed as the image. Now this is a simple little diagram of the principle that that ladder works on in the back of the camera. Here's the flight path of an aircraft and incidentally it's traveling in a dead straight line at a predetermined height above the ground. There's the ground. Now it takes its first photograph, let's say there, and that covers an area of ground like that. And they've given us a little point of reference, which we'll say is a tree there, which appears in reverse on the film up there in the top left-hand corner. Now, the aircraft moves on, and the ladder moves on, predetermined distance in time, let's say eight or 10 seconds. And it then takes another photograph, a little bit further along, which is represented there, and our tree, our little focal point, has appeared now in the top right-hand corner. And the distance apart that these successive photographs are taken is absolutely critical. They must be exactly the same for the making of the map to work. The film, or survey, is kept under tight security from the moment it leaves the aircraft until it arrives at headquarters. This is extremely important because the survey aircraft may have flown over sensitive security areas and revealed classified information. Now, if such was the case, the subsequent mapping would be done by a limited number of staff cleared for top security. Once the film is cleared, all 480 exposures on each roll have to be checked for quality, slightly more than your holiday snapshot roll of 35 millimeter or 120 film. Now this is a photograph taken by the camera in the aircraft. It's an ordinary nine by nine contact print. And in fact, it shows the Ordnance Survey building that we're in at the moment. They'd need incidentally about 300 of these to do the whole of Southampton. But there is a problem in making maps from photographs like that. Remember that we're about 5,000 feet above the ground. Bit easier if I explain it on this big enlargement. Right in the center of the photograph, we've got houses, which we're obviously looking straight down on vertically. All you can see is the roofs. Look up there, though, and you can see the side walls of buildings. Come down this way, and you can see the walls on the opposite side of the buildings. Now, that presents great problems in making a map. So, how do we get over it? David. What do you do? Well, we overcome the problem by using a stereoscopic uh, stereo plotting instrument, which means, first of all, we have to take a stereoscopic cover of an area. If you look at these two contact prints, you will see that there is an area on each of them which overlaps the other one. 
And in fact, we have an overlap on these contact prints of around 60%. So there you've got the bend in the river, so it's dead center there, and it's, it's right down there in that one. Exactly. Right. This distance between the two exposures on this scale of photography approximates to half a kilometer. We would expect, therefore, to expose a photograph in the aircraft about every eight seconds or so. And you do a whole sequence of those all the way down so that you've got overlaps all the way. That's right. And then what do you do with the overlaps? We take the pair of photographs and we put them into the stereo plotting instrument and with that instrument we can correct for the sort of displacements which you saw on the enlargement. Now this is the stereo plotter. This is the machine that turns the information on those two overlapping photographs into one stereoscopic image. Now what we've got are two consecutive photographs mounted here and here. And part of the reason that this is so complicated is that the position of each of these photographs has to reflect exactly the position of the aircraft when the photograph was taken. Now at the moment you can see that the aircraft was in a fairly horizontal position. But say it had gone into a side slip you've got to be able to repeat that precisely. So with all these ratchets and gimbals, you can tilt these photo carriers over to equal the position of the aircraft. Now these rods are also extremely important because each of these represents light being reflected from a given object on the ground when the photograph was taken, let's say a church. This one on the right represents the ray of light coming up from the church when this right-hand photograph was taken. This one on the left, and remember the aircraft has moved along, so the angle's going to be different, represents the light coming from the church when the left-hand photograph was taken. All right, we've almost reached the point now where photographic images can be turned into lines on paper, or in this case, a stable plastic. Les Waterhouse is the operator. Les, tell me exactly what you're doing over there. Well, incorporated in the optical train of the instrument is a small reference point, or floating mark, as we call it. Uh, this floating mark, I can move in the horizontal direction with these two hand wheels, and in the vertical direction by means of a disc on the floor here by my right foot. So you're seeing a little dot through your binoculars then? Mm, that's right, yes. Um, the horizontal movements of this uh, reference mark are translated through a mechanical system onto a plotting point on the plotting table over there. Right, now what exactly are you following with the dot? I'm tracing around all the detail which we want to show on the finished, on the finished plot. Does that mean to say that you've got to go down every single road and around every single house all the way around it? That's right, all the permanent detail which I can see through the binoculars. And how do you, how do you sort of lift it and drop it so that you don't have a house connecting up to a road? Well, that is done by means of a switch by my left foot, which I can press, and then that drops the pencil point over on the plotting table. It must take an awful lot of skill. How long does it take you to actually make a map like that? Uh, one of those maps takes approximately uh, a fortnight to actually do the plotting. I still haven't quite got the hang of the thing, actually. Can you show me again what you do? Certainly. And when the map has been traced out by the stereo plotter, it's sent to the field surveyor for checking. Now, this is the map that came back from the field surveyor. And his job is a very important one, because this is one instant where the camera can lie. This is the map that came from the stereo plotter. There are whole areas of it which have just been penciled in roughly. Now that's because the camera in the aircraft took an overhead aerial view and it saw things, for example, like overhanging eaves of houses, trees spreading out to obscure fences, 
hedges bushing out from the top. What in fact it needs to do is to see the baseline of all those objects. So the field surveyor goes out and he takes observations and measurements in the field to correct what the aerial photographs saw. Not only that, he puts in house numbers and street names, all the little details. He comes back with this map, and this now has to be enlarged further. Now, if you thought that camera in the aircraft was a big one, you've seen nothing yet. The Little John camera isn't exactly very little. In fact, it's one of the biggest cameras in the country. The depth of focus is very shallow, and everything to be photographed must be in the same plane and parallel to the focal plane. In order to reproduce extremely fine definition, the camera is rigidly mounted and free from all vibration, 25 feet long and 10 feet high. For this type of work, the film used is extremely slow, and the normal exposure time is about 20 seconds, with an aperture setting of between f45 and f32 and it uses interchangeable lenses of 48, 30, and 18-inch focal length. Focusing is critical, and the camera operator carefully checks the image on a ground glass screen. The screen's covered with a two-centimeter grid to establish actual size and perimeters of the photographic copy required. When the focusing is complete, the shutter is closed and the screen is swung away to be replaced by the film, which is held onto its frame by vacuum. With the aperture set to the required exposure, the film is exposed. Like everything else in the making of maps, here the processing of the film is carefully controlled and supervised. Nowhere in the chain can there be any flaws that may cause mistakes. For the people who work in the Ordnance Survey, the photograph is not a thing of beauty but an accurate image providing precise measurements. Now, this is the negative that came out of that enormous camera. It's called a forward reading negative because unlike a traditional one, you can actually read the writing on it. It's not back to front. It's about one and a half times the size of that surveyor's map. Now, you might say to yourself, well, why don't they make an ordinary enlargement? And the answer to that is that they've gone for pinpoint accuracy all the way through this entire process. And an ordinary enlarger would produce all sorts of distortions, which the big camera doesn't. It faithfully reproduces. Why so big? Well, we'll see the answer to that in the next stage of the process. And like so many things today, now computer technology takes over. All the information on the forward reading negative is transferred by a cartographer into digital information. The negative is laid on a special table and an electronic reader translates each feature by the press of a button. Alongside the negative is a menu with a long list of standard features, anything from a square outline house to a pylon or a telephone box. By pointing the cursor at a given symbol, she'll put into digital information a number which indicates what she's outlining. In this case, she's concentrating on recording the houses from the negative onto computer tape. From now on, it'll be the computer tape that will mastermind all the operations to make the finished map. The Ordnance Survey holds Britain's national archive of large-scale maps, and an ever-increasing number of them are being put into computer tape. These tapes are made available to any professional body, such as the town planning department or the water board. All they need 
plot their maps from the computer information is this Cynetics machine. It's sophisticated and expensive, but a map that would take days for a draftsman to complete can be done by this in minutes. It's being used here for checking the tape compiled from the information on our negative. Now, the cartographer turning our negative into computer numbers was liable to human error. She could have left a house out, she could have put a wall the wrong angle, or perhaps a street name might be in the wrong place. Now, this operator, David, is correcting those mistakes. He's got the original negative in front of him, which we know to be correct, and he's got the computer results brought up on a screen here. Now, we know that there's a mistake down in this area, so he's going to enlarge that area up. Can you do that now, David? Those mistakes would, of course, have been first seen on the results of the Zynetic plot. That proof map will have been inspected, and somebody will have actually pinpointed these errors on it. And we can see the results come up now, and in fact, we've got a building which is very much out of square here, and we've got a health clinic sign in the middle of a field. The health clinic's there, presumably. So can you correct those now? And this is done with a little gadget which David's operating. It's all very complicated electronics. And in fact, he's extending the lines here and making a square on that building. So that's corrected that one. And he's now pulling the health clinic across into the right place. That's it, and then the, then the reconstituted map's going to come up now. And we now know that all those mistakes have been corrected, that the proof is now right, all the information's gone into the computer tape, and we're ready to make a positive for our actual final print of the map. when I went almost, but not quite, at the end of the process of making our map. All the information stored on the computer tape in numbers has been checked, it's been corrected, and it's now 100% accurate. That information is being fed into a machine next door, which is not unlike the Zynetic plotter, except that instead of using pens onto a plastic sheet, it's using a fine beam of light onto light-sensitive film. track of that light can be seen by the operator on this little monitor screen. So, we've gone from numbers on a computer roll to a final drawing of our map on clear film, which is going to be used to make the printing plate. The final stage in the making of our map takes place here in the print room. We followed through the process of making one large-scale map, but it's only part of the huge output from here. Every day, over 30,000 maps come off these presses to feed a demand that's increasing each year. So, we've seen the whole process of making a map from beginning to end, starting with a photograph. Now, the Ordnance Survey are the official surveying and map publishing organisation of Great Britain. They like to think of themselves as an information service, but theirs is not just to make the little coloured map that I bought in the shop. Theirs is to provide maps for professional use, for the day-to-day -day work of the nation. They start off by surveying the different areas of the country, and they make maps on three basic scales. They make a six-inch-to-the-mile map for wilderness, 
They make 25 inch to the mile scale for farmland, and they make a big 50 inch to the mile scale for towns and cities. Now, out of that, they can make a whole lot of different scales. They can make my little colored map. They can make a six inch to the mile scale map of Scarborough down there. They make these maps for people like planners, property transfer people, for essential services like electricity, gas, water, telephone. Not only do they make these maps on different scales, they can also make them in different forms. If you're a professional, like Electricity Board, you can buy a copy of the computer tape. Now, this has got no less than 200 maps stored on it. You can also buy your map on clear plastic sheet, like that. Or you can buy it in the form of a little microfilm. In fact, if you think about it, you might say that they started with a photograph and they finished with a photograph. Mm -hmm.